morning. Thank you, Tavares. Thank you, Jonah, um, for being with us. So to give you some context for when I first encountered this photo essay um, that, that Jonah did. So there's a lot of conversation um, increasingly, and there was over 2015, increasingly conversations about fit, about the importance of belonging, about scholars, young scholars, uh, particularly scholars of color, um, uh, coming from disadvantaged backgrounds and um, trying to make sure that they have a place at the institutions um, that can propel them into success. Um, the importance of belonging would come to be a huge theme in coverage throughout the year, but one of the, uh, the stories that really captured the texture of the struggle of what it means to fit in or not fit in at a place was this photo essay, this um, the set of images instantly started spreading around the education um, uh, coverage sphere. I saw it tweeted by every education reporter that I, I follow on Twitter. Um, the set of photos of, uh, of Tavares in his first year at Connecticut College, having been transplanted there from the south side of Chicago. The images, which we'll walk through in a second, um, are extraordinary and they tell they tell a story that I think will come across quite vividly. And I'll ask in a moment, um, Jonah, to walk through those, those photos. Um, but I think one thing is important to frame um, in where this story sits in Tavares' Tavaris life. Talked about how the photo essay kind of reverberated throughout um, the, uh, the internet and the ed reform community. But um, in a lot of ways, you can think of this moment, um, Tavares, at 14 years old, um, he was in juvie. Um, uh, he managed to, he was gangbanging, fighting the works, he said, um, and something happened. There was a turnaround. Um, Tavares managed to um, pull himself up to end high school in the National Honor Society, 4.2 GPA on the student council with a full ride scholarship to Connecticut College. And in the movie of Tavares' life, you would think of this as the culmination. This is where his mentor, Kim Michelson, played by Michelle Pfeiffer, the music swelling, he's succeeded, he's ended up at Connecticut. Um, but in fact, it is a stage in the journey. Graduation from high school at that height was the stage in the journey. And then he brought himself to Connecticut. Um, and the journey continues, and the struggle continues. Let's look, through, look at these photos uh, for a moment. And Jonah, I'd ask you to just say a few words about each one and, and where it sits. Starting. Sure. So part of the, uh, the issue for me as a photographer was coming into this uh, story at this stage of the journey. And I needed to represent sort of the south side of Chicago and where uh, Tavares came from. So this first set of images is from the south side of Chicago, uh, this one in particular. Um, sort of him looking warily outside the outside the window of a car. Oop, sorry, can we go back one image? I accidentally skipped over one. Thank you. So this is Tavares, uh, his uh, foster brother on the left, his cousin uh, in the center right, and a friend of theirs outside his biological grandmother's house in the south side. Um, and this sort of represents a little bit about the neighborhood and the relationships of, from, from when she came. One more back. Thanks. Uh, so this, this is Tavares' uh, foster family. This is his foster mother in the middle and his foster father on the, on the top left. And Tavares will be the first person to tell you that his foster mom is a big reason why he uh, went to college, pushing him along the way and, and, and keeping him there. And a lot of the weight of the family falls on her shoulders, and I think this image uh, illustrates both of those things pretty well. Back one more time, thank you. Uh, so here we have, here we have Tavares walking uh, onto campus. This is Connecticut College, uh, juxtaposition between him and sort of the old brick. And um, this, this was taken during, uh, early during his freshman year. <laughs> it's not gonna work, but yes, this one. Uh, so here we have part of the uh, social struggle, the leap that he needed to make um, that was not, there's no roadmap for him. Uh, his high school, his high school is about 3% white and Connecticut College is about 3% black. So aside from the social issues, uh, obviously the academics were a big issue too. 
Um, he he had never written papers like he had been like he was being asked to write, and uh, so there was a big there was a big struggle there. Without getting into too much detail, there's a big struggle academically to get up to the academic vigor of, of a place like Connecticut College. I want to dwell on this next image um, for a moment. Um, uh, because you said when you captured this, when you knew that you had made a, made a, an important photo. Yeah, this this is one of my uh, favorite images because this the piece is so uh, mental. It's so difficult to to sort of represent in photographs um, because a lot of what's going on, a lot of the issues that are you know sort of bearing down on Tavares are not photographable. They're not visual. Um, so I really worked hard to sort of get into, visualize his headspace. Um, and so that's why this image uh, is, one of, is one of my favorites in the piece, because it sort of, it, 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 it hits a lot of those, strikes a lot of those chords. So uh, one of the few things that Tavares has been able to take from uh, South Side of Chicago to Connecticut is dance. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really important to him. Um, so dance needed to be represented, and I think this is one of the, one of the striking images of him dancing in the studio. Uh, this is from this is from uh, one of his African Africana Studies classes, and it was one of the uh, one of the first times I saw him truly engaged in class, um, and it was a striking moment. And here is the final image of this edit, and this sort of encapsulates a little bit about uh, his road, uh, the ongoing journey, and that this story isn't really over. Um, and he has this sort of, you know, this eye on graduation, this eye on, a, on the prize, um, but that the, the struggle is not really over. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Jonah. And now, Tavares, we're going to stop awkwardly talking about you, and I'm going to talk to you for a few <laughs> minutes. Um, um, Connecticut College. You're on the south side of Chicago. You've done a tour. You've mentioned you'd spent a couple weeks at Emory. You did a tour of a couple other colleges. Um, and you chose Connecticut College. What drew you there, first of all? Um, well, uh, I had a, it was a program called Genesis. It's for high school students who want to uh, learn about colleges. And uh, I ended up going to Connecticut College. And while I was there, it was at the time uh, an alumni reunion, and like it was mainly minorities and stuff like that. And it was showing me the academics, and it was helping me out. And it was like the people I usually be around talking to me. So I was, I felt so comfortable. Like I was able to be myself. So I'm like, yo, I love this college, yo. Just from the first experience, I'm like, I'm got, I gotta go, I gotta be there. And like I apply early decision right away because. I felt so comfortable at that moment, and that was what made me like pretty much stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you um, you describe in your words in the photo essay in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, you describe at one moment saying, asking yourself the question while you're at Connecticut, like, do I belong here? Um, and at another moment, you you see a, a photo of you in like H and M gear and a hoodie and um, and H and M sneakers um, in Chicago. Asking, do I belong here? Where do you feel like you belong most? Where does that? Well, Chicago is always going to be my hometown. Uh, I can never let that go. So, I definitely belong to Chicago. And uh, when I was in Connecticut, on the other hand, I belong, but not. It's in a more of a um, a learning type process. Chicago is like the place where I get to be me, in a way. Yeah, and uh, what has been the difference? You, you're now about to enter your junior year um, at Connecticut. Um, what's changed for you, um, and what remains the same, I guess? Well, uh, I still feel awkward being on college because you know it's not the type of crowd I hang around with or be with. But I've been able to do academics. I've been able to get through it and understand more because of the help I, I have to force myself to ask. I'm not the person who usually asks for help because I was always used to doing things on my own. Um, but I feel I'm able to like adapt and also talk to people more, like socialize better because of being there for two years. So those are two things that strongly I feel has been 
uh, what's the word for it? <laughs> Helpful. Why was I at the college? Yeah. yeah. Um, you talk a lot about the people in your life, Kim Michelson, one of your mentors in Chicago. Um, your friend Tommy, also back in Chicago. I'm, I'm really curious, um, uh, thinking about when you go back, you know, you're coming here from Connecticut today, but you'll be back um, in Chicago over the summer. Uh, um, what do your friends think? How do they feel about your, um, the journey that you're on at the moment? Well, see, my friends, they are the type to make fun of me, be like, yo, you're a college, this isn't it. But they support me 100%. Like, regardless of what I do, as long as it's positive, they have my back regardless. Like, they all have their particular ways of handling things to get money and take care of their family. It might be drug dealing, it might be making rap videos or whatever. But they know, like, I'm on a different, different road. So they, they respect that. Like, as much as they make jokes and talk about it, like, they like, yo, do you make it? I want you to make it as, try to, try to reach the highest peak. They, they support me so much and I respect them for that. Like, like, not too, not, you never get friends like that all the time, but like, those are true people who really understand, like, I want to do this and they respect me for what I want to do. Um, you mentioned, um, in, in the essay, um, a moment when you, you felt like you could just leave, um, that you considered just walking off campus. And you said that struggle is sort of ever present and probably would always be while you were in Connecticut. Do you still feel that way? And what keeps you there? Well, um, oh, I, I can't lie, I always feel that way. It's just like, even though I'm able to adapt, I still can't be me to my full extent. I still can't like, you know, speak my slang or, you know, do certain things I do at home. But at the same time, it's a learning process. Like, I want to be able to adapt anywhere and be able to fit in any crowd. I want to be able to have sources. So if I need to do a certain thing, I'll have this type of education to, to back me up. Like, that's why, that's what keeps me there. That's, that's what's making me stay there. Sources that I need in order for me to do what I want to do when I get out of college. In a few minutes, I want to go to, to questions from the audience, but there's one question I wanted to make sure to ask. So, you know, there's a way, um, a lot of folks saw your story, they found it inspiring um, that you're at this college, they're rooting for you to get your, your degree um, and succeed. But I'm curious, you clear aside everyone's expectations for you, um, what anyone might want for your life. And when you ask yourself what this degree might do to you, what this ex or do for you, what this experience might do for you, and what you want your life to be like, what is that, what's your answer to that question? Well, um, besides what everybody say, I want to help people because all my life it's been a, a hard time not having, you know, parents and always doing things on my own and, and having to make, like, build myself and to stay positive. Like, I just imagine, like, what other people go through. Like, that's, that, it's in a similar situation, but also even worse. Like, I want to help those who can't do it. Like, those, those, those drug dealers, those game breakers, those 13 to 12-year-olds who live in Chicago or any other place that don't have the guidance or the sources to get to high school or to get to college. I want to be there. I want to motivate them. I want to build a program or fundraisers or anything just to, just to feel like, like someone is getting help. They, I want to provide for people. I want to help others. That's, that's my goal. Like, because even though there are people who've been in my life, such as my mom and my foster parents, like, some people don't have that at all. Like, some people just, it's hard to explain. Some people just, like, where I come from, some people are taught a different way. Like, when my, where I used to live at in the hood, some kids were just born into work living and selling drugs in the streets. They were never taught to go to school or to have other plans and beyond selling drugs. So if, if you do something that you always know, you're going to keep doing it. And if somebody tell you, oh, you should go to high school, you should do this, you're going to be uncomfortable because you're so used to doing that particular thing. It becomes, it scares you like, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to go to school. I know how to make money. I know I get this, put this particular amount of money in my pocket. Like if I'm getting money and I'm taking care of my family, in a bad way, and I know that's the only way I can do it, and I, I keep getting money, why would I want to change for someone else or be successful when I know I keep making money? Like, yeah. that's, that's my take. I want, to, I want to reach out, I want to teach others, like, yo, you can do it, it's another way, like, it's a better way, it's a, it's a, it's a positive way that you can do it, pretty awesome. much. Thank you for that. We have time, I think, for the briefest question. Um, 
Leah Haskins from the advisory board company, specifically Education Advisory Board. So I want to thank you for sharing your story, especially about some of the struggles you um, encountered, you know, feeling different on campus. And I want to know, besides just increasing um, minority enrollment, what resources would you have really benefited from when, once you actually got on campus as a minority student? What do you think that these predominantly white institutions should be keeping in mind when bringing in more diverse student bodies? Well, I think one thing they should keep in mind is like, some, some minorities don't have the same academic level as others. So when you're in a class, you put us in a class full of, just say, 30, because my college is small. So I'm in a class full of 30, and everybody's answering these questions with all these, these advanced words and stuff, and I'm just sitting here like, whoa. <laughs> like, and then the teacher's like, why are you not answering questions? I'm like, do you see this? Like, I don't want to look bad. Like, I don't want to say something, and then everybody looking like, oh, he's stupid, or he doesn't really understand the topic. Like, I just want them to know, like, they should put that out there, because I've been in so many classes and I felt so uncomfortable just sitting there and everybody's just like so happy, oh yeah, me. <laughs> and I'm just saying like, oh, I'm not gonna answer that question. So yeah, I think, just want, I, think like, I want other colleges to know like, yo, some, acad some people, like how they learn is not the way, you just can't put the way um, this certain group learn and put another group who learns a different way into a class where it's very highly advanced and I can't answer questions or some other people feel comfortable to answer questions, like I feel like they should like really think about that. Like that's something they should really put into thought because I know a lot of people in my class would be like after class like, yo, did you, did you understand what they were saying? I'm like, nah, I didn't, but I was trying to. I was taking notes. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely. So if I, can I just yeah. add one? So that's uh, academically, I think that that, yeah. uh, that, would, that would be great. As, uh, on a social level, on a cultural level, I think we also need to change the way that we think about diversity on campus and, and how, how, what that diversity really represents to the school. And it's not, we need to humanize the diversity and not look at quotas and not look at it like that and not look at, and not look at the culture of diversity coming to fit a mold that we already have at a school and instead really appreciate what it is that diversity does for a campus and what different, cult different cultures do for a campus and foster growth that meets somewhere in the middle and not trying to pull one sector over to the other to fit an institutional culture that we already have. Jonah, Tavares, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all of you for the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you.